I'm working on a Kyrak prep table. This is a glycol prep table. So they've got a condensed unit down here. The condensed unit has a TXV and it cools a flat plate heat exchanger in the back. I'll show you in a minute. Then they have a glycol pump that pumps glycol across that heat exchanger, pumps it to the bottom and to the top. So we have no refrigerant in the bottom section evaporator or the cold rail. And then glycol is pumped to the bottom section. So when I got here, my temperature controller said um, run error and the unit was short cycling on and off. I put my service gauges on it and it was acting like it was pumped down because I had low head pressure and my suction pressure was just on off, on off, on off. Now I've had a history with these boxes before where I've um, had bad glycol pumps. So that was the first place I checked. I amped out the glycol pump. It was running at 0.9 amps. My thought was that it was working. So then my next thought was uh, maybe the evaporator froze up because I have seen that before. So I uh, unplugged the compressor and let the glycol pump run for a little while and uh, just to try to defrost the evaporator if it was frozen up. Um, I got a little, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, I had my blinders on and I wasn't thinking straight. So couldn't figure out what was going on with the box. Again, I still had the back of my head that maybe it had a bad glycol pump. So I called tech support, asked them what the amperage should be on the glycol pump. And they informed me that anything above 0.5 is all good. So, and then he just asked me, well, how do you know you're not low on refrigerant? And I said, well, it's acting like it's pumping down because my refrigerant's staying the same. And he says, you know what? He goes, put a little refrigerant in there, see what happens. Sure than shit, put some gas in there. And that was it. I went in with the notion that this thing possibly had a bad pump because I've had history with the pumps failing on these. It's important to always go in with an open mind. It's all right to have some things in the back of your head, but don't go in with blinders on like I did today. You know, I didn't waste too much time. We're talking 10, 15 minutes, but still, I the unit ended up having a refrigerant leak and it's on the uh, suction service valve of which I'll put a picture up right now so you guys can see. Um, so I topped off the charge and got it operational. But again, I'm just saying don't go in with blinders because it happens to the best of us and there's nothing wrong with it. Just try to do your best not to. Okay, so here's our glycol pump, little guy right here. It's got a plug going into the top. Kind of hard to see, but I was able to get an amp reading on those wires. Sorry, it's not focusing really well. But it has a plug that you can disconnect. So I disconnected, checked for 120, I had it and then amped it out and I had 0.9. My flat plate heat exchanger is back behind here, inside here, okay? But all it does is just pumps glycol. It tells you to keep the glycol within a certain level. And it's got a solenoid to shut off the bottom section, glycol flow. So that way they can continue to cool the top because the top runs a little bit colder than the bottom. But it's not too difficult of a box, but again, it's just, it's really easy to go in thinking it's one thing and ignore some obvious signs. So nobody's perfect, everybody does it, just to try to prevent it. Okay, so it's important to understand that, you know, we all make mistakes and it happens, you know, to learn from them obviously is the important thing, you know, and to recognize that, hey, there was a mistake there. So again, it really didn't take me long, but I did go in there with the, with the mindset that, hey, we've probably got a bad pump. So I just kind of went down that path. And there's nothing wrong with me checking what I checked. I mean, I probably still would have checked that even if it was just a refrigerant leak, just because I've had those problems before. But the whole notion that I went in there thinking that it was a bad pump, you know, so I investigated down that path. Luckily, like I said, it was only 10 minutes or something like that, but I could have gone down a rabbit hole of unhooking the pump, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know? So, um, but you know, when I called tech support and he says, well, Hey, I mean, do you think it's possibly just low in refrigerant? It's like, you know what? I didn't even think about that. You know I mean? I, I assumed that it was just pumping down. But yeah, it was just low on refrigerant. That's all it was, okay? So um, I talked to uh, tech support um, and uh, you know he gave me the, the an idea where to look, what kind of pressures they run on that unit. It's pretty typical for what you think. Um, so that's where we were running. I topped off the charge. I'm gonna go ahead and order the rotolock valve 
and uh, we'll come back out and replace the dryer and the rotor lock valve, and they'll be up and running. I shouldn't say. They're up and running right now. I topped off the charge, so it's good. I just gave them a disclaimer. Hey, this box still has a leak. Make sure that you guys are really watching it because I don't want you to have to throw away product. You know, coming in the morning and the box is at 70 degrees or something. So I basically put the decision on them to leave product in it or not. You know, my recommendation is, is, hey, use it during the day because you're here, then unload it at nighttime and then load it in the morning. That way you know it's working and you don't lose product. Okay, so I got the parts. We're back. We're going to go ahead and uh, get going on this guy. Recover the charge, change the rotor lock valve, change the dryer, vacuum it down, and recharge. So let's hope it doesn't go too crazy. This is a small little system, so I'm just recovering through my gauges. It only takes a second. Gas out of this thing real quick. As soon as we get the gas out, we'll get in there and start taking it apart. It's going to be tight. This thing's really difficult to get in here. But we will get it. So that valve is what we're going to be changing. It's nice and tight in there. So I cut the rotor lock valve out. I'm gonna make a new piece for that. But since I got that out, I'm gonna go ahead and change this dryer while it's tucked back in here and I got a little more space. Um, they were using a 3 8 dryer with bushings. I'm gonna just go ahead and put a straight quarter inch, eight cubic inch dryer in there. So, okay, I got it mocked up. See, I swaged it right here. It goes into the copper. So, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, weld on this guy. Whenever you're welding on these service valves, you always want to mid-seat the stem because they'll get stuck if you go one way either direction and then you'll have to change the whole valve. So always put it in the mid-seat. And I'd love to say wrap this thing with a wet towel and all that good stuff, but it ain't going to work. So sometimes you just got to wing it. Okay, my valve's welded in. It was tight. I did it with minimal burning. I think I just had a little bit of meltage right here, and that's it. Okay, you know, one of the big important things is, is number one, you have to learn how not to react because when you're when you're brazing, I should have called it brazing a minute ago. When you're brazing, you will burn yourself, okay? So number one, learn how not to react because reacting can hurt you. When you panic because you brought the torches across your fingers and then you drop the torches and then you catch your pants on fire, Sounds silly, but that's when you really get hurt, okay? Life happens, you rub up against a discharge line while it's running, and then you freak out and you jam your hand in the condenser fan blade. You know, you gotta learn how not to react. And then number two, you gotta learn how to weld blind, meaning I could only hit this weld from this point right here, and from this point, and I was able to get just from the other side, just a little bit from the other side. You have to learn how to turn your heat up. You know, when you when you go to school, they teach you how to weld in a lab, and it's all pretty because you can get to all sides of it, and and they look perfect, and the teacher cuts them open, and you use minimal solder and all that stuff. Okay, in the field, lay the solder on there. Now that you learned how to braze, you know, in a class, now it's time to get out into the real world and use some solder, use some heat. Don't be afraid to use a bigger tip than usual. I braze with a number two tip at all times. Uh, you go to school and they're going to tell you to braze with a zero or a number one. Well, number two is what works for me, okay? Um, so anyways, I got it all in. Uh, the welds look half ass decent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and now i got to get this pressure control on this other side, which is right here. That's going to be a bitch. So, okay. I got the pressure control on the other side of that valve now. Um, Nylog is your best friend or a thread sealant. I prefer Nylog just because Blue Death makes a mess. Leak lock, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't care what people say about flares. Uh, you have to use a thread sealant. So I prefer the Nylog because it's an oil-based sealant and it doesn't cause problems. Um, and uh, you know, for the people that want to comment, I'd love to see you get your uh, torque wrench back there. Uh, it ain't happening. So just an open-ended 5 8 Tighten that puppy down. A little Nylog on there. Now I'm going to pull the uh, old rotor lock gasket out right there that you can barely see. Put the new rotor lock gasket in. Put a little uh, nylog on the nut. That's the other thing too, you know, uh, nylog works as an oil too. So you can use nylog for the threads and you can use nylog to lubricate the nut. Which helps the nut to spin and not grab the inside of the rotor lock valve. Same thing for the flare. 
So we're gonna put a little nylog on the back side over here, and then put a little nylog on the threads over here. And we'll take just a teeny bit of nylog and wrap it, uh, wipe it around the uh, O-ring, and then uh, we'll be good to go back in this bad boy down, and hopefully there's no leak. Okay, I am a tool whore. I have every tool, you know, I, I buy everything just because I enjoy it. There is a time and place to use your fancy tools. Something like this, this is where, and oh my goodness, drum beat, here we go. There's a time to use your field piece gauges that have a micron gauge in them. This is that time. There is no room to put fancy vacuum manifolds, single hose setups with half inch hoses. Again, I use them when they're necessary and when they're applicable. In a situation like this, it's tight. I have no room. I don't have the space to get in here with my big hoses. Okay, and my core removal tools and everything. Are these, you know, is this the best way to do it? No, but does this serve a purpose? Heck yeah, okay? You have to know how to use it. You have to know how to analyze the readings. Could it go faster if I used a single hose setup on each thing without a manifold? Heck yeah, would there be less potential for leaks? Heck yeah, but real world, sometimes you can, okay? Oh yeah, and again, don't kill me, Jim Bergman. Quarter inch going to the thing. Yes, I could put a 3 8 on there. Yes, I do have it, but I'm really not in that big of a hurry on something like this, okay? Um, but don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing any of that stuff because I have and use every one of those tools. You know, Appion Megaflow kits, vacuum trees. I have it all, and I will use it in the situations where it warrants itself. But in this situation, it doesn't. It's not really, you know... Uh, practical okay also you need to be 500% sure that your welds are good okay you can't be relying on a nitrogen pressure test to make sure that your welds are gonna hold all right you need confidence in your welds I'd like someone to tell me how I'm gonna get back there and fix that dryer now that this thing's all back together if there's a leak on that dryer okay tell me how that's gonna happen it's not so, you know, I had to take this apart in pieces. I had to put it back together in pieces. The dryer was the first thing to go in. I'm 100% sure my welds are not leaking on that dryer. Okay, you have to be confident in that. You cannot rely on a nitrogen pressure test to make sure that your welds are gonna hold. It, you know, there's times and places where you're gonna do it, but think about it again, practicality. It's not very practical on something like this. So, okay, you have to know, uh, sorry about that rant, but um, on another note, you have to know the sequence of operation and how your box works. There's no point in vacuuming down when I got two solenoid valves blocking the refrigerant flow, right? So I had to, uh, uh, actually I only have one solenoid valve blocking the refrigerant flow. But uh, I turned on power because the low pressure control is shutting the unit off right now, so I'm vacuuming the whole system down. All right, it's up and running. Kind of cool, the box temp actually didn't come up very high at all. Cabinet 41 in the three hours I was working on this and rail at 36, that's not too bad. Anyways, we're operating, it held a good vacuum, did a leak check, used soap bubbles too, on all my welds, everything looks good. Okay, you always wanna weigh in the charge when you can. Um, this particular system. They don't design them with sight glasses and there's no room to put a sight glass in here. Um, so, uh, we're gonna take our, uh, these are gonna be kind of rules of thumb. Again, you always weigh your charge in. Uh, I've got the factory pressures because I weighed it in, so now we're gonna compare it to a rule of thumb just to give us a ballpark idea where we're at. So, it says 73, I'm gonna call it 75 for the ambient air. So we're currently just a little above 30 degrees over ambient for our liquid saturation temperature. And we're just a hair right at about 30 degrees under a box temp for our vapor saturation temperature. 25 to 30 degrees for our vapor saturation temperature is uh, pretty typical. And 25 to 30 degrees above ambient is pretty typical on uh, reaching cooler because they run higher box TDs on these things. So again, though, this thing's pulling down, so it's under a heavy load right now. Um, so, you know, take it as with a grain of salt, I guess you should say. 
But these are just rules of thumb. Again, I weighed in the charge. I know that my charge is correct. So just kind of gives you an idea. You know, there's there's no way. The manufacturer is not going to tell you that you should have 30 degrees above ambient and 25 degrees below box temp. It's just things that you have to kind of pay attention to. And as you work on this equipment more and more, you kind of remember, okay, this one typically runs. So it gives you a ballpark idea on how to check charge, you know, without pulling the charge out and weighing it back in. But pulling the charge out and weighing it back in is the only way to do it right. You know, let's just say that uh, I came out here and the system was low like I did the other day. I just uh, put refrigerant in it until I was 30 over ambient on our liquid saturation temperature. Then I knew I was in the ballpark and I knew that when I came back today I would weigh in the charge and get the exact amount in there. If we were having a refrigeration problem like just with the bottom section then we would look at the TXV, we'd pay a little more attention to the pressures but right now the fact that I weighed it in and I'm within my rule of thumb on my vapor saturation temperature right here and my liquid saturation temperature tells me that we're pretty good. So a little recap, we had a service call on a Kyrak Blue, they call their glycol system, their blue um, prep table. Uh, the unit was low in refrigerant, found a refrigerant leak on the suction service valve, went ahead and talked to the factory, the unit's actually still under partial warranty, got all the parts ordered, received the parts, came back out, recovered all the gas, changed the valve, changed the dryer. Like I showed you guys in the video, that's a really tight box. Everything's in really uh, intricate places and you kind of like have to do things in steps. You can't just jump in there and change the valve. It's easier to do the dryer first. You know, you saw how I did it. So I gave you a few tips in there. Those are my personal opinions, okay? Uh, that does not reign true for everything. In that particular situation, I use my manifold to vacuum through. Um, I don't always do that only in certain situations where I find it necessary, okay? Um, I prefer to use uh, vacuum core removal tools and vacuum hoses and, you know, do it right, but there's times where it's just not practical, okay? There's what's practical and what's not practical, and this is one of those times where it was just easier to pull it through my gauges, okay? That's not something I do all the time, but like I said, it happens sometimes. Uh, other than that, it was a pretty straightforward repair. Um, no major problems, no leaks, uh, and the box, you know, never even really got that high while I was working on it. So that's pretty much it. All right.